That was wonderful. I was thinking the only thing better than a men's quartet is the ladies' trio, <laughs> my daughters. All right, let's stand, please. This is a wonderful Sunday night crowd. Now, it's not a good Monday night crowd, but it's a good Sunday night crowd. Uh, I told the pastor, there is not a Baptist preacher in this country who thinks his ushers know how to count. And uh, this is a good crowd. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11. By the way, uh, for those of you who are illiterate, there are a lot of pictures of our meetings in the back of my autobiography, so uh, I know that some of you may be illiterate. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 27. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Thank you very much. You may be seated. History tells us that the logical successor to the Pharaoh of Egypt would have been his son. In the event that Pharaoh did not have a son, his daughter's son would be the next Pharaoh of the land. Most of you are aware how Moses became Pharaoh's daughter's son. Pharaoh's daughter was down by the river of Egypt taking her daily bath. Now, she did not take a weekly bath. She took a daily bath. I had a roommate in college who took a weekly bath. And it was so terrible, we went to the dean of men, Pastor, and we said, can we throw him in the shower and scrub him down? And we got permission to do that. And I'll tell you, his socks were t so terrible, they would almost stand up by themselves. But uh, he took a weekly bath, Pharaoh's daughter, a, a daily bath. Three fellows were riding down the road, and one fellow said, somebody's deodorant's wearing off. Other fellow said, Ain't mine. I don't wear any. But anyway, she took a daily bath. Well, as she was taking her daily bath, she heard some crying going on in the bulrushes. She went over and picked up this little baby boy and adopted him as her very own. Now, any of you young people tonight know what the name Moses means? Any of you? Okay, what does it mean? You got your hand up? It means, yes. Good. Amen. That's wonderful. Reminds me of, uh, I was preaching at Pensacola, and I was preaching about Janice and Jambres in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3. And uh, I said, now, I don't expect any of you to know who Janice and Jambres were, but I said, out of a wild guess, would anybody like to venture who Janice and Jambres were? A fellow raised his hand, and I said, all right, tell me. He said they were the magicians in Pharaoh's court. I said, I am impressed. I said, how did you know that? He said, I've heard you preach this message before. <laughs> <laughs> so the name Moses means to draw out of the water. Every time she addressed Moses by name, she was reminded that she drew him out of the water. Now, make no mistake about it. Moses was being groomed to be the next Pharaoh of the land. Acts 7 and verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and in deed. You know what that means? He had access to the finest private tutorage of his day. He was weighted on hand and foot. He wore the finest robes of his day, rolled in the finest chariots of his day. Whenever he would walk out the door on occasion, trumpets would blow and people would fall down on their faces and do obeisance to him. But 
there came a time when Moses had a choice to make. Am I going to waste my life in the palace of the king as Pharaoh over the land of Egypt, or am I going to let my life count for God? I'm speaking tonight on this subject. What will you do with your life? There were three things that Moses had to decide upon. Now, I wish I could take credit for this outline, but God is the one who put it in this passage. Three things, they all start with the letter R. All right, number one, notice please verse 23, his uh, refusal. It says, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. All right, look this way. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Moses is looking out the window, and he saw his Hebrew brothers under hard labor and bondage. They were in servitude, making bricks out of slime and mortar. And the Egyptians would come along with their scorpion-like whips, and they would crack them on the back. Well, Moses became overcome with that. He went down, he killed an Egyptian, and he buried him in the sand. With that act, Moses was saying no to the palace and yes to the will of God. Now, wait a minute. I am not saying that it was the will of God for Moses to kill that Egyptian. Not saying that. But I am saying that from the time he killed that Egyptian, he could never be Pharaoh over the land of Egypt, his refusal. Let me ask you, have you ever refused anything for the will of God? Luke 9 and verse 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse 27, if any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, and his sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, young people, what does it mean when it says we're to hate our father and mother, wife, children, etc.? Does that mean that when I pick up my wife at the airport in Charlotte on Saturday night, I am to wrap my arms around her neck and say, Honey, I hate you. No. In the Bible, terms of emotion are terms of comparison. You see, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, terms of comparison. And here's what it means. We are to love the will of God so much that the love for our father, our mother, etc., will all seem as hatred in comparison to our love for the will of God. Are you willing to refuse? 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul said, I die daily. Philippians 3, 7, and 8, he says, but those things which were gained to me, those I counted loss for Jesus Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You know what he was saying? He was saying, I've counted my own will as garbage, refuse, in comparison to my love for the will of God. Are you willing to refuse? There comes a time when a girl has to refuse a boyfriend. That boyfriend may be saved. He may read his Bible every day. But that girl has the call of God on her life for the mission field. That boy doesn't. She's got to be willing to refuse for the will of God. There comes a time when a young man in the military has to refuse being in there for 20 or 30 years and getting a good retirement, getting a promotion uh, in the military. He's got to be willing to refuse for the will of God. Hey, here's a man whose job transfers him to California. He goes out there and he scouts out the place. There's no good fundamental Baptist church in that area. No Christian school to put his children in. If he takes that promotion, he is doing the same thing that Lot did. Lot made a life decision based on a material reason. I tell our students, you do not make life decisions based on a material reason. Hey, 
Abraham went to Canaan. Why? Because of a spiritual reason. Hey, he'd never been to Canaan before. He didn't know what the land of Canaan was like for raising cattle. But I will tell you, his eyes were far above the land of Canaan. He looked for a city that had foundation whose builder and maker is God. Abraham made a spiritual decision. Lot made a material position, uh, a decision. Are you willing to refuse for the will of God? Paul was getting ready to leave Ephesus. He had labored there for three years. The Miletum elder said, Now, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, they're liable to kill you. They're liable to stone you. They're liable to put you in prison. You know what Paul said? Acts 20, 22 through 24. He said, But now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that befall me there, save that in every city, Bonds and afflictions abide me. Well, here's what he said. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know what Paul was saying? He was saying, I don't care if they beat me. I don't care if they put me in prison. My life is only dear unto the will of God. Are you willing to refuse? 1976, we had our first mission field trip to Kenya, Africa. After that trip, for the next several years, our team spent six to eight weeks on mission fields at our own expense. Why? Because we found that we could reach more unsaved people in one night by accident in a third world country than we could in six days of a meeting in a revival meeting in America. And so I was so burdened about getting laborers to go to Kenya. I remember our meeting in January of 1977. I was preaching in Clovis, New Mexico. God reached down in that meeting and he saw Bill Finch. He had spent 21 years in the military as a mechanic. He was getting ready to retire, set up a garage, and work for himself. God reached down in that meeting and he said, Bill Finch, I don't want you wasting your life in a Chevrolet garage. I want you in my service. You know what Bill Finch did? He left his nets, went on deputation, went to Kenya, Africa, was there for 25 years starting churches. Are you willing to refuse? Hey, I was preaching that same year in Albuquerque, New Mexico. God looked down and he saw Dr. Uh, Ralph Stewart, a Ph.D. in science, working in a chemical laboratory. All right, in 77, he was making a six-figure salary. God reached down in that meeting and he said, Ralph Stewart, I don't want you wasting your life in a chemical laboratory. I want you in my service. You know what he did? He left his nets, went to Maranatha Baptist Bible College as a professor in biology, making $15,000 a year. The last I heard, Ralph Stewart had started a church in southern Illinois that he was the pastor. He was willing to refuse for the will of God. I preached in 1979 in Marshalltown, Iowa. God reached down and he saw Bob Matney, superintendent of the public school system. And God reached down and he said, Bob Matney, I don't want you wasting your life on a system I gave up on. He said, I want you in my service. So he left his nets, went to Newington, Connecticut, was the headmaster for a Christian school, making half the salary he was making in Marshalltown, Iowa. I preached in that chapel, Pastor. Forty-seven young people came down the aisle and surrendered for full-time Christian service. Bob Matney got up before his young people with tears in his eyes. He said, young people, five years ago in a Ron Comfort meeting, I did the same thing you've done today. He said, you know why I did it? Because if I spent all my life in the public school system, I could never see 47 young people surrender for full-time Christian service. Are you willing to refuse? Now let me say this. My heart has never been more burdened. Girls, please listen. My heart has never been more burdened than it is tonight for this fact. 
we have less young people going away to Christian colleges to train to serve God than we did before the advent of the Christian school in the 60s. Why? Three-fourths of the pastors I'm with in the next five years are going to be, re be retiring. Who's going to take their places? I want to ask you, Mom and Dad, when's the last time you got down on your knees and you said, Dear God, I don't care if my girl's popular. I don't care if my girl's a cheerleader. I want her to serve God with her life. When's the last time you got on your knees and you said, Dear God, I don't care if my boy can jump like Michael Jordan. I don't want my boy to enjoy the American dream. I want my boy to, boy to preach the gospel. I'm convinced that if we could restore the praying moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, we could fill the vacancies around the world. Now listen to this tremendous email that I received. A uh, young man who was at Pensacola Christian College, uh, his name is, last name is Williams, he said around uh, some years ago, several years ago, you preached a message at Franklin Road Baptist Church about praying for your kids to be in the ministry. At the end of the sermon, you said in the congregation to stand up if they would commit to praying every day for their kids to be in the ministry. Well... My grandparents, Stan and Mary Williams, stood up and committed to pray every day for their kids to be in the ministry. Long story short, their son and daughter both were called to be in the ministry and still are in the ministry today. My Aunt Melissa went to Bible college, married a guy named Bruce Barber. They have now been in the ministry for over 25 years. My dad, Jonathan Williams, also went to Bible college and married Angel Rice. We have been in the ministry for over 22 years. But you, if you had not preached that message that night, I don't know if I would be in the ministry today. My grandparents would not likely have committed to pray, and my life would probably be very different. That's because of a grandparent's who said, I'm going to start praying for my children to go into full-time Christian service. I, I'm never concerned, Pastor, about some young person who comes to me and says, Brother Comfort, I hope I find the will of God for my life. Now listen, I tell our students, the will of God is not distant. It's daily. I don't know what God wants me to do in 10 years, but I know what God wants me to do today. And if I'm in the will of God today, I'm going to be in it tomorrow. And here's a promise, John 7, 17. If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know. Now, Psalm 40 and verse 8, there are two things that are involved in knowing the will of God. David said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. So two things you need. You need a delight or a desire to do the will of God. Number two, you need to validate the will of God by the Word of God. I was coming back from a mission field trip years ago, and I met missionary J.T. Lyons. Do you know that name? One of the finest missionaries of our day. He's in heaven now. And uh, J.T. Lyons said, Brother Comfort, uh, let me tell you how we came to Spain. He said, I had been in Liberia for 20 years. And he said, I had a hard time learning the language. And he said, I was a bush pilot. God gave me a new plane. And I was so excited about getting to go into the bush and reach people that have never been reached. But he said, I was coming back on furlough, and I came through Spain. And God began to speak to my heart about going to Spain. And I began to argue with the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm 58 years of age. I had a hard time learning the language in Liberia. I certainly can't learn the language in Spain at 58 years of age. And so he came home on furlough, and it seemed like every single day God placed on his heart and on his mind, you need to go to Spain. One night he tried to go to sleep. He couldn't go to sleep. And so he got up, picked up his Bible, listen, and he turned to Romans 15 and verse 24. When thou comest into Spain, I will come unto thee. So he closed his Bible, went and woke up his wife and said, Honey, it's settled. We're going to Spain. 
He validated the Word of God, the will of God through the Word of God. So number one is refusal. Notice, please, number two, his reproach. Verse 26. It's his esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. His refusal, number two, his reproach. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, the next day, after he had killed the Egyptian, he's looking out the window and he sees some of his Hebrew brothers fighting each other. So he leaves the palace and he goes down and he breaks them up and he says, wait a minute, we're in this thing together. If we don't hang together, we're going to hang separately. You can't be fighting each other. You know what they said to him? They said, big shot, who made you a judge and a ruler over us? Who do you think you are? I want to say that began a life of reproach that he was to experience until the last day that he lived and he stood on Mount Nebo in Deuteronomy 34. All right, now get this. One month, one month after he led the children of Israel over the Red Sea, Exodus 15 and verse 24, they came to a place called Merah and the whole nation murmured against him. Numbers 14 and verse 22 says, they murmured against him ten times. Now when you read that phrase, it simply means that over and over and over and over and over again, they murmured against Moses. Exodus 17, they came to a place called Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. And so the Bible says they picked up stones and they started to stone Moses. How do you think Moses responded? You think he said, now wait a minute. You're taking this out on me, and all I'm doing is obeying God. If you don't like it, take it out on God. Don't take it out on me. You think he responded like that? No. You think he said, all right, you want to stone me? Step out here one by one, put them up. We'll see who's going to stone whom. You think he did that? No. I love what Exodus 17 and verse 4 says. When they picked up stones to stone Moses, it says, and Moses cried unto the Lord. That was his place of refuge, just getting alone with God. I have in the front of my Bible four words. God help me to live by these four words. No attack, no defense. And that was Moses' attitude. No attack, no defense. And I believe that when they picked up stones to stone Moses, the devil reached down in Moses' ear and he said, Moses, you're a dumb fool. You could be sitting in the palace as king over the land of Egypt. These people don't appreciate you. I believe the saddest chapter in the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 34. Here God brings Moses up to Mount Nebo and he says, now Moses... Look over there in the promised land. He said, you can see it, but your feet will not touch down in it in this life. Why? Don't you remember, Moses? I told you to speak to the rock, and you smote the rock. You disobeyed me. And because you disobeyed me, I will not let you enter the promised land in your lifetime. Hey, you know what I believe the devil said at that time? I believe he said, Moses, you're a dumb fool. You could be in the palace of the king now for 40 years. These people didn't appreciate you. Every step of the way, they murmured against you. And now, you're God. That's some God you've got there, Moses. After 40 years, he won't even let you enter the promised land. You know what I believe Moses replied? I believe he said, Satan, shut up. Shut up. Why? Better to suffer reproach in the will of God than to sit in the palace of the king outside of the will of God. Can I say that again? Better to suffer reproach in the will of God than to sit in the palace of the king outside of the will of God. The world can't understand that. In the midst of reproach, the child of God and the will of God can still have the joy bells ringing in his heart. Now listen to this. Uh, Tiger Woods got in the PGA in 1996. 
Tiger Woods since then has made $1.4 billion. Not million, billion. He spent $55 million on a private jet. He has a yacht that is 155 feet long. It cost him $25 million. He has 10 acres in Jupiter, Florida, which cost him $55 million. He takes his own furniture with him to PGA events so he can feel comfortable. Are you listening? The worst day I've had in the ministry in the will of God is better than the best day Tiger Woods has had with all of his toys. Why? The peer group tells you this, kids. They say if you surrender for the will of God, God's going to make you miserable. I'll tell you who will make you miserable. The peer group. The peer group. The only place of peace and happiness is in the will of God. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you willing, ladies and gentlemen, to refuse? Are you willing to suffer reproach? The world don't understand how a child of God can be persecuted and still be uh, enjoying the blessings of God. For instance, in Acts chapter 4, Peter, James, and John are taken into the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin said, you better shut your mouth about this man Jesus. If you keep talking about this man Jesus, we'll cut your body to rivets with the cat of nine tails. You know what they said? Acts 4 and verse 20. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Go ahead and beat us. We're still going to preach about Jesus. In Acts 5, this time they were not threatened. This time they were beaten. They beat them 13 times on the right side, 13 times in the center, 13 times on the left side. But you know what Acts 5 and verse 41 says? It says, and they departed from the presence of the council. What? Rejoicing. That they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the reproach, but the joy bells are still ringing in the heart. Do you know every disciple that Jesus had died a martyr's death except John? John was boiled in hot seething oil, banished to the Isle of Patmos, where he died a slow, painful, agonizing death. James, a brother of our Lord, when he was 92, he was taken to prison. He was urged to renounce his faith in Jesus Christ and escape martyrdom. So on his way to his execution, he led his executioner to Christ. And they both went out and they died a martyr's death together. Matthew was slain with a large knife. Mark was dragged to death by the people of Alexandria. Luke was hanged on an olive tree. They got ready to crucify Peter. You know what Peter said? He said, no, I'm not worthy to die the way the Son of God did. So at Peter's own request, they crucified him upside down with his head pointing toward the ground. Young people, that's the origin of the so-called peace symbol of the broken cross. Do you know that's always been a symbol of anti-Christendom? When Titus and his Roman soldiers marched into Jerusalem in 70 A.D., they carried the inverted or the broken cross. That's always been a symbol of anti-Christendom. The most stirring place that I've ever been except for the open tomb of Christ was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. You go in the Mamertine prison in Rome, there's a stone floor. There's a grate. They would remove the grate, throw a victim down to a dark, damp, dingy, dismal dun dungeon. On one side, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. On the other side, he was chained to a Roman cell. As he would lie there on the floor, he could watch the rats as they gnawed away at his body. 
He could watch the lice as they crawled all over his body. The guy told us that before they cut off the head of the Apostle Paul, are you listening? He led 37 of the guards to Jesus Christ. And when they cut off his head, he was singing the praises of God. I think about Polycarp, the aged pastor of the church at Smyrna. When Polycarp was well in his 90s, he was taken to the pro-council, urged her announce his faith in Christ, and escape martyrdom. Polycarp came out with these famous words. He said, Eighty and six years have I served the Lord Christ, and he's never done me anything but good. How then can I renounce my King and my Savior? They led this tottery old man out to nail him to the stake. As they started to pound the ten-inch spikes, Polycarp said, No, no. He said, You don't have to nail me to the stake to secure my remaining in the fire. He said, the same God that gave me grace to come to the fire will give me grace to remain in the fire without being nailed to the stake. That day they doused his body with pitch. They lit a match, and his body became a human torch. You know what Polycarp was heard praying in his dying moments? I thank thee, O God, that thou hast preserved me until this moment and given me the opportunity of taking my place among the martyrs. They had something. All right, number one is refusal. Number two is reproach. Now notice, please, again, verse 24. It says, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Number three is reward. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, Moses' eyes were on the finish line. And those distractions on the sidelines didn't bother him. Why? Because his eyes were on the finish line. Now, in Matthew 11, 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Uh, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward. In heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. In closing, three things about the reward. Number one, there's the well done when we cross the finish line. Second Timothy 4, 6 through 8, Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Now, remember I told you that Moses did not get to enter the promised land in his lifetime? But come with me over a thousand years later. Jesus goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. Who did they see on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. Why? I believe God came to Moses and he said, Now Moses, you led the children of Israel for 40 years, and because you disobeyed me in the wilderness, I didn't let you enter the promised land in this lifetime. But he said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to take you to the promised land with me now. You know, every September 14th, I write in my journal these words. Thank you, dear God, for another year of fruitful service. And my ultimate prayer is that when I cross that finish line, there will be no moral indictment against my life. And I'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Number two, there's the peace we have in our heart. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give I unto you. John 16, 33, these things have been spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Young people, listen to me. There has never been a day in 57 years when I've gotten up and looked in the mirror and I said, God, I'm so sorry you've called me to be an evangelist. Never! I want you to know that I'm not enduring what I'm doing. Bless God, I am enjoying it. And the only place of peace and happiness is in the will of God. I preached 35, 40 years ago in Atlanta, Georgia. 
a young medical student from Georgia Tech came to me, and he said, Brother Comfort, somebody gave me your tape on the holiness of God. He said, I listened to it, and I sat there with my mouth open. He said, it was different than anything I had caricatured in my mind about God. He said, after I played it one time, I put it back in, and I played it the second time. And he said, when it finished the second time, I was on my knees asking God to save me. So, 35 years later, I was preaching in Blairsville, Georgia. After the Sunday school, a well-dressed, handsome man came in. He said to the pastor, I want to talk to Brother Comfort, but I don't want to talk to him before he preaches. I don't want to get his mind off his message. So after the service, Dr. Will Moody came to me. He held out his hand. He said, I'm Dr. Will Moody. He said, do you remember 35 years ago or so, a, a medical student from Georgia Tech came to you and said, he heard your tape on the holiness of God and he was saved. He reached in his pocket, preacher, and he said, here's that tape. He said, I was that medical student. I said, well, Dr. Moody, tell, I want to know the circumstances surrounding your salvation I said, can we get together for lunch this week and you tell me about the circumstances? He said, sure. He said, I have 11 surgeries on Tuesday. He's one of the greatest surgeons in Georgia. He said, on Wednesday we can get together. So we sat down in a restaurant. I said, tell me about the circumstances surrounding your salvation. He said, Brother Comfort, I was in my frat house at Georgia Tech and my frat brothers were in the next room smoking pot and drinking liquor. He said, however, I had my Bible open, and I was down on my knees, and I was weeping, and I said, God, please send somebody along to show me how to be saved. He said, when he got up from his knees, a knock came to the door. He opened the door. Here was a young man involved in a college ministry. He had gone around these fellows smoking pot and drinking liquor and knocked on Will Moody's door. And he introduced himself, and uh, Will Moody said, You know, you're an answer to prayer. He said, I was just down on my knees, and I was weeping, and I was asking God to send somebody along to show me how to be saved. He said, Can you show me how to be saved? And the young man said, listen, I've got this tape on the holiness of God. He said, I want you to listen to it, and after you've listened to it, I'll come back and show you how to be saved. After Will Moody had played it two times, he got saved. The man didn't have to tell him how to get saved. And when we got up to leave the restaurant, Will Moody reached in his pocket, pulled out an envelope, he said, now, I hope this will not offend you, but I would like to give you something. In that envelope was 16 $100 bills. It didn't offend me, preacher. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. That $1,600 has been spent a long time ago. But the joy of seeing Will Moody, he said, my wife got saved. My children are saved. They're in Christian colleges training to serve the Lord. No amount of money can buy the joy in my heart. The money is gone, but the joy will never be gone of being in the will of God. Number one, there's a well done. Number two, there's a peace we have in our heart. And number three, in Luke 18, 28 through 30, Peter came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, we've left all and followed you. What are we going to get out of it? And Jesus said, Peter, you not only get in the life to come, life everlasting, get it. But in this life, you'll get manifold more. That's the third part of the reward. Mark 10 and verse 30. Jesus said, no man's left father, mother, house, and lands, but what I'll multiply unto you a hundredfold. As a 15-year-old boy, I began to realize what that meant. My brother was saved in the military. He was on his way downtown in Panama City, Florida to get drunk. He and his buddy stopped by an outdoor meeting and they listened to the preacher preach. 
And after the preacher preached, he said, now if you'd like to know how your sins are forgiven, he said, come down and talk to me. So my brother went down, he got saved. He never went downtown and got drunk. He went back to his barracks and he wrote his mom and dad and he said, mom and dad, I've been born again. He wrote to his little brother and he said, Ronnie, I've received Christ. I want you to have what I have. So Billy went to Bob Jones. He got out of the military two years early so he could train to be a preacher. So he got, uh, he got out of the military after two years instead of four years. And the first semester after he was there, he came to Elmire, New York, where we were living at the time. And he had his little brother out on the street winning people to Christ. Now, from the age of 7 to 15, I had sung in nightclub stage, radio, and TV. I had one consuming goal in life, to see my name in lights. On a Sunday night, instead of being in a service like this, I was in a nightclub singing somewhere. Always had to be accompanied by an adult, my grandfather and my father. And so when Billy came and I got saved, he had me out on the street winning souls. We took the wordless book and we were leading young people to Christ through the wordless book. And so we were having a street meeting in Elmire, New York. The police saw what we were doing. They came and they stopped my brother from preaching. They said, young man, you can't do this without a permit. You've got to have a permit or you cannot preach on the streets. Across the street from where we were having the street meeting was the Elmira Rescue Mission. Al Shaw, who was the superintendent, came to us. And he said, boys, he said, I've heard you preach. He said, I like what I've heard. He said, I was a drunkard. And I had no goal in life. He said, God saved me. And he called me to preach. And he said, I'm superintendent of the rescue mission. He said, now, boys, I want you to transfer the street meeting over to the rescue mission. We had three weeks of meetings in the rescue mission. Billy preached. I did the singing. I came to my dad, and I said, Dad, God saved me. He's called me to preach. And I said, if you'll let me, I'll go to Bob Jones Academy and I'll begin to prepare to preach as a sophomore in high school. He said, son, you're a fool. He said, everything we've worked for all your life is down the drain. I said, dad, that's all in the past. I don't care about that anymore. I want to preach. God's called me to preach. He said, son, you can go, but if you go, I will not send you one penny. In the three years I was in the academy, my daddy did not send me one penny. And the academy cost the same as the university did. The four years I was in college, one weekend my dad broke his word and he sent me $5. In seven years, he sent me $5. But God began to multiply unto me, fathers and mothers. The last night of the meeting in the rescue mission, Al Shaw called me to the platform. He said, Ronnie, here were his words. You are my Timothy. You're my son in the faith. He said the offerings for the three weeks of meetings have been $150. He said, I have a check made out to you to begin to prepare to preach at Bob Jones Academy. Again, God multiplied unto me. Daddy, my first year in college, I had a roommate named Billy Shelton. Billy lived in the dorm. His parents lived in Greenville. I believe God had him in the dorm for my benefit. One night, Billy came to me and he said, Ron, he said, I've told my parents about you and they want to meet you. Can you go home uh, to supper with me? So I went home, met the Sheltons, and right away God established a wonderful relationship. And they said, we want you to call us Mom and Dad Shelton. And every week you are at Bob Jones Academy or the university. You will go to the mailbox and you will get an envelope with some money in it to take care of your incidentals. And many times they would send me checks to put on my room board and tuition. Again, God multiplied unto me a father and a mother. After my senior year in the academy, my classmate Ed Shaw said, Ron, uh, I can get you a job in Caldwell, Idaho. If you'll come home with me for the summer and you can work on construction. So I got a job as a hod carrier for a bricklayer. After five weeks, the house we were working on was finished. And so I looked around Caldwell for work, couldn't find any. And somebody came to me and said, Ron, if you can get to Chicago, 
uh, there are good jobs, they pay well, you can earn money to go back to school in the fall. So I hitchhiked from Caldwell, Idaho to Chicago, Illinois. I stayed in the YMCA hotel for two weeks. I came within a hair of getting a job. I guess I should say I came within a half an inch. I went to the railroad and they measured me. And they said, you're five feet five and a half. We have a policy. We don't hire anybody less than five feet six. I think I'm going to sue them. But anyway, the last day I was in Chicago, I got a call from a classmate, Barbara Bentley. Number one, I don't know how she knew to contact me at the YMCA hotel. Number two, I don't know how she knew that I was looking for a job. She said, Ron, uh, my dad is an electrician here in Buffalo, New York. If you can get here to Buffalo, you can stay in our home the rest of the summer and you can work as an electrician's helper for my dad. So I hitchhiked from Chicago to Buffalo, stayed in the Bentley's home the rest of the summer. One day they came to me and they said, Ron, we have one daughter, Barb. We feel like we've got another son. We feel like you're our son. I want you to call us, Mom and Dad Bentley. If you have a need, please let us know. The next week, I went back to the university, and I had a basketball injury, a cartilage operation. I was laying in the hospital, getting behind on my schoolwork and on my bill. And I got that dreaded letter from the business office. It said, Dear Ron, we have kept you so long without your being able to pay your bill. If this bill is not paid by such and such a date, we have no recourse. We must send you home. I didn't know how that money was going to get there. But before that day was over, I got a letter from Mom and Dad Bentley. And they said, Ron, we love you. We pray for you. And God's laid it on our heart to send you a check. Evidently, you need this for your room board and tuition. You know how much that check was for? The exact amount to the penny that I owed in the business office. Again, God multiplied unto me a father and a mother. After my freshman year in college, one of my classmates, uh, Fred Skills, came to me. He said, Ron, I'm from Roseburg, Oregon. My dad's involved in the lumber industry. He said, why don't you come home with me this summer? And my dad can put you to work in the sawmills. And so we were with the Bentleys or, or, or with the Skills for three summers. One day they came to me and they said, Ron, we have two daughters, Kathy and Karen. We have a son six feet four inches, Freddie. And they said, now we feel like we've got a little son. We feel like you're our son. And if you have a need, don't hesitate to call us. You know, every Christmas while my girls were growing up, we would get a check at Christmas, and the note would read, divide this five ways, three ways for our grandchildren, my daughters, two ways for our children, my wife and me. They sent us money to come from Clarksburg, West Virginia, to uh, uh, Oregon for Christmas. They flew from Oregon to Phoenix for our meetings. They flew from Oregon to Tampa, Florida for our meetings. And I believe if they were living, if I had a need today, I could call them up and say, Dad Skills, I need $10,000. Can I borrow $10,000? I believe a check would be in the mail tomorrow for $10,000. Now, why did God do that? All right, I'm closing. After three and a half months at Bob Jones Academy my first year, I went back to Elmira, New York for Christmas. My mom and dad were drunk nine out of 10 days, nine out of 10 days. The last night I was home was the longest night of my life. My mom and dad didn't come home all night long. Our house was heated with oil. The oil was gone. There was no heat in the house. Snow was two to three feet deep outside. I sat in a rocking chair that night covered up with covers and I could see my breath and I thought nine out of ten days my parents have been drunk. The last night I'm home, they haven't even come home to be with me. I stayed around the house a long time the next morning just hoping and praying mom and dad would come home. 
wrap their arms around my neck, hug me and kiss me and say, Ronnie, we love you, and kiss me goodbye. Finally, 10 o'clock, they had not come home. So I went out to the highway. I stuck out my thumb. Tears were streaming down my face. As I stood there hitchhiking, I thought nine out of ten days my parents had been drunk. The last night I'm home, Mom and Dad haven't even come home to be with me. And the last morning, they haven't even come home to kiss me goodbye and tell me they love me. But listen to me. God has made that up to Ron Comfort hundreds of times since then. You see, many of you tonight are like the poet. I said, let me walk in the fields. He said, no, walk in the town. I said, but there are no flowers there. He said, no flowers, but a crown. I said, but I'll miss the light, and friends will miss me, they say. He said, choose today whether I am to miss you today. I pleaded for time to be given. He said, is it hard to decide? Twill not seem so hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I took one look at the fields, then cast my face toward the town. He said, my child, will you yield? Will you give up the flowers for the crown? And into my hand went his. And into my heart came he. Now I walk in the light divine, the path I had feared to see. Hallelujah for the will of God. Everything I have or ever will be is due to one thing, the will of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask the pianist to come and play, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, now listen carefully because I'm going to ask a question differently than I've ever asked in this pulpit. I'm not asking you right now if you are saved. I'm not asking you that. But I'm asking you this. Since you were saved, was there a time when you surrendered to do the will of God? And tonight you would say, Brother Comfort, if I know my heart, I'm in the will of God. I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm where God wants me to be. If I know my heart, I'm in the will of God. If you can honestly say there was a time and a place after I was saved, I surrendered for the will of God, and tonight I'm in the will of God. If you can honestly say that, slip up your hand, please. Keep it up just a moment. Keep it up just a moment. Pastor and I are watching. All right, thank you, Pastor. I would say 50% probably. That's wonderful. But you know what that means. If 50% have, then 50% have not. I wonder tonight, how many of you would say, Brother Comfort, tonight on June the 9th, 2019, tonight I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God. Whatever, wherever it may lead, tonight I am surrendering my life to do the will of God. If you would say that, would you slip up your hand, please? And I will pray for you. God bless you, young man. And you, young lady. And you, ma'am. Others, yes, God bless you. That's four I could see. Any others tonight, God bless you back there. That's five, somebody else. Tonight I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God. Whatever, wherever it may lead, along with these five, you can put your hand down if you've raised it. Others, tonight I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God. Anyone else along with these five? Anybody else? All right, listen carefully. Those of you that raise your hand, look at me just a moment, please. If you have said, I'm going to surrender my life to do the will of God, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you just to come and kneel at the altar. But Brother Arnie and Pastor will be here at the front. I want you young people to come to Brother Arnie and say, Tonight I'm giving my life to do the will of God. All the adults that will come, I want you to take the pastor's hand and say, Tonight I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God. And we'll have somebody pray with you. 
So right now, those of you who said, I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God, I want you to come as these men come and stand here. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Others, you said, I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God. God bless you. God bless you. Others have raised their hand, but you haven't come. Would you come? Father, I have no idea the ramifications of this message nor this invitation. I have no idea what some people are struggling with right now to decipher the will of God. But I pray that in years to come, we'll be able to see the results of what's happened tonight. Now, God, for the next part of this invitation, I pray that you'll grant us to have the kind of decisions that I read about in the email, where moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas are willing to begin praying that their children and their grandchildren will go into full-time Christian service. In Jesus' name. Now with our heads bowed, if tonight you would say as a grandparent or a parent, I'm going to start praying or I've been praying that my grandchildren and my children will go into full-time Christian service. You say, wait a minute, are you telling me I'm to push my children into full-time Christian service? No. Here's what I'm saying. Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. So I'm asking you to do exactly what Jesus has commanded you to do. So tonight as a parent or a grandparent, you would say, I'm going to start praying or I've been praying that God will put my children and my grandchildren in full-time Christian service. Stand to your feet right where you are. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Keep standing. God bless you. I'm going to start praying or I've been praying that God would put my children and my grandchildren in full-time Christian service. Others along with these. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come and kneel at this altar and claim Matthew 9, 37. And your pastor is going to come and pray that God will give you the desires of your heart. So right now, as you're standing, just make your way to the front. If you're not able to kneel, you can sit on the front chairs. God bless you. Pastor, would you come and pray for these? Lord, we thank you tonight for the commitment these have made to pray or to continue praying for the working in the heart of young people. Lord, certainly we want to see folks called out of this church that are called in full-time Christian service. Lord, we certainly first and foremost want our young people to do the will of God. And no doubt if they say yes, as we ought to say yes every day, no doubt some of them are going to be called directly into a vocational full-time ministry. Lord, we want to see church planners, missionaries, and certainly we want to see personal soul winners uh, raised up from this church and to be used in a mighty way to reach our world, our community. And Lord, would you put it on our heart. Continue to burden us in prayer that we might continue to be faithful to pray and ask you to work that laborers would enter the harvest. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're certainly thankful tonight for God's word being shared. And I hope that we will certainly, uh, nothing more not simple and central to the Christian life than to want to do the will of God today and certainly to be burdened to pray for our young people. Of course, we first of all pray for ourselves. God, help me to be surrendered, but to pray that our young people uh, would, would go into the ministry. Uh, that's a good prayer. I've prayed that for my kids. Um, uh, certainly, we, uh, I can't call them to preach. I've met some people that were called by their mom and dad. That didn't work. God's got to call them, but certainly we can pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest. Certainly a, a tremendous blessing tonight, a challenge and a help. We're going to be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. I hope you invite somebody to come. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. And I'm going to ask Mr. Sonny Hogg if he'll pray for us.